Former British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw is in the Iranian capital Tehran along with a delegation of British lawmakers. The high profile visit is the first since the two nations restored diplomatic ties. But do these visits have more to do with business opportunities than politics? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. The UK-Iranian ties are thawing as former British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw leads a delegation of MPs to Tehran. They are meeting Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif as well as other senior members of parliament. The visit is the first since Britain severed almost all ties with the Islamic Republic after its embassy was attacked in November 2011. And though both countries' embassies remain closed in London and Tehran, relations between them have improved since Hassan Rouhani took over as president last year. Our relations between Britain and Iran deteriorated during former President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's time in office. In November 2011, the UK imposed new sanctions against Iran, worsening an already weak economy. Iran responded by downgrading its relations with Britain. Its embassy in Tehran was then attacked. British Foreign Secretary William Haig warned Iran would face serious consequences over the incident. Britain expelled Iranian diplomats and closed its embassy in Tehran. And it wasn't until October last year that both countries announced they would appoint diplomats to work towards restoring relations. Well, let's bring in our guests now to talk more about this. In Tehran, we have Sadegh Zebakalam, Professor of Political Science at the University of Tehran. In London, Babak Imamian, he's a member of the British Iranian Business Association. And joining us on Skype from Yorkshire, Richard Dalton, he's a former British ambassador to Iran. Welcome, uh, all of you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Zadek Zebakalam, if I could start with you, what do you make of this visit then? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think this uh, visit is uh, is very important uh, with regard to the past uh, eight years of uh, of the row between uh, Tehran and 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 London. Moreover, uh, uh, moreover, I must point to the uh, to the uh, character uh, and and the existence of uh, Jack Straw. I think Jack Straw has been regarded by by many Iranians uh, as uh, b b b as a statesman, as a British uh, b politician, who has always looked uh, warmly towards Iranian, unlike many other uh, Western statesmen, Western leaders who have, uh, who have always uh, looked at Iran with, with contempt and animosity. Jack Straw has always been regarded by, by many Iranian as, uh, as a few exceptions that, uh, that are kind and considerate uh, towards Iran. Res they, they, they respect Iran and they can understand how to deal with, uh, with Iranians. So I'm very, I'm very much hopeful that, uh, that uh, the presence of, of Jack Straw would be the beginning, uh, would, would mark the, the, a new era in um, Iran and, uh, and the West. Richard Dalton, is this a, a real sign of a thaw in relations for you? Well, this is a, going to be a slow process. Uh, each country has got its concerns about the policy and behavior of the other, uh, and there will be a discussion going on between the two governments. Uh, Mr. Straw and his delegation are not part of those discussions. Uh, this is a, a parallel activity, uh, and I don't know how far the UK chargé d'affaires nominated to Tehran and the Iranian chargé d'affaires nominated to London have got in their discussions. Uh, but I, I agree with Sadiq Ziba Kalam that this is an important visit. Uh, it's a symbol of what the British government wants, which is a renewed, creative, cooperative relationship with Iran, not glossing over the serious differences that we have on policy, uh, but seeking to work together where we can uh, in our mutual interests and in the interests of the Middle East region as a whole. 
Babaki Imam Yana, someone from, uh, from the business community, do you see the potential for, for future opportunities here? I mean, how much do economic factors uh, have to do with all of this? Well, this is a move in the right direction, but uh, these are giants. Uh, Lord, Lord Lamont uh, and Jack Straw are giants uh, in politics, and I don't want to take anything away from Mr. Wallace or Mr. Corbyn, but they represent they don't represent anything from the business community. I would have thought if they were interested to conduct any business in Iran, they would have taken uh, a business delegate with themselves. Uh, the signs are that they see very little prospect of doing business with Iran. That's what, why they've not taken any business delegation with themselves. And as uh, Sir Dalton said, this is a slow process. They're not, it, it doesn't seem that they're really interested in developing business relationship with Iran. On the other hand, I'm very surprised from Jawad Zarif that they did not request a business delegation to come with this delegation. After all, Iran's biggest asset is its labor force. Uh, and its labor force, which is highly educated and highly skilled, needs to be globalized. And majority of this labor force consists of women. 60% of university intakes in Iran are women. And the, there's a group of special interest groups in Iran that trying to stop uh, labor market in Iran becoming globalized just purely for their own self-interest and Jawad Zarif had the opportunity to stop breaking this mold. Well let's broaden this out um, a little then and talk about uh, Britain's relationship with uh, other countries that it considered uh, uh, rogue nations. This isn't the first time uh, that Britain has restored relations with countries it once considered uh, rogue countries. In 2004, Tony Blair shook hands with Muammar Gaddafi, saying there was real hope for what he called a new relationship. The historic move came after Libya accepted responsibility for the bombing of the Pan Am flight over Lockerbie that killed 270 people in 1988. And in 2012, British Prime Minister David Cameron became the first Western leader in five decades to visit Myanmar, a country once considered a pariah state. He announced a dramatic shift after opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi was elected to parliament and called on the European Union to ease sanctions on Myanmar. Sadiq uh, Zibakalam, if I could turn back to you then. I mean, we gave a few examples there uh, of previous instances where um, uh, previously rogue nations, as, as they were called, were, were uh, allowed to come uh, back out of the cold, as it were. Um, do you see the same thing eventually happening uh, with Iran in terms of its relations with, with Western nations, and, including Britain? <clears throat> The relation with, the, with Iran, with the Islamic Republic of Iran, very much depends upon the outcome of the present uh, um, negotiation uh, over uh, Iran's nuclear uh, uh, activities. What I'm really trying, what I really want to say is that if there is um, ultimately a breakthrough in Iran's uh, um, nuclear program uh, and, and uh, we could see at the end of the day that uh, there is understanding, there is a compromise as far as Iran nuclear program is concerned between Iran and five plus one. Then I would thought that uh, under, under these circumstances uh, there will be a breakthrough with the, with the West as far as um, the economy is concerned, economic ties, etc., etc. If, heaven forbid, God forbid, if um, the Geneva talk doesn't take us anywhere and uh, there are deadlocks, uh, be it uh, b b from the Iranian uh, fault or, or, or rather the Western fault or b b hardliners in Iran, hardliners in Washington, uh, it doesn't matter who, uh, who actually uh, makes the stumbling block. But if there, is no, if there is no compromise, if there is no agreement over the nuclear issue in Geneva, at the end of the day, I think uh, Jack Straw's visit to Tehran would go down the drain because there would be no improvement, there would be no uh, new development as far as Iran's relation um, with the West is concerned. Everything depends upon the, the outcome of the Geneva talk. Richard Dalton, how do you see Britain's role then uh, in terms of improving relations between Iran and, and Western nations uh, in general? Does it act as a, as a, uh, as a, as a kind of temper uh, to the United States in a, in a way? Well, we, 
work very closely with Russia, China, the United States, France, and Germany in that group. And of course, the spokesperson for that group is uh, Lady Ashton, uh, who is responsible to the European Union as a whole. So Britain is working with its partners, and we are approaching the negotiations in Geneva extremely positively. Uh, they should succeed. They must succeed uh, for the sake of the region, for the sake of the Iranian people, for the sake of the uh, progress to prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons in the long term and to preserve the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So the stakes are very high, and, and Britain is aware of that. Uh, I don't think at present uh, there is a need for anybody to temper the position of the United States. The United States is negotiating very constructively under the instructions given by President Obama to uh, Mr. Kerry. Uh, and uh, the first step, of course, is to agree the details for the implementation of the first stage agreement and program of action that was laid down in Geneva on November the 24th. Uh, and I'm hoping that those details of the implementation will be agreed towards the end of January. Uh, there would then follow a period of six months. The ambition is to achieve as much of, as possible of the comprehensive agreement in that six months. Uh, if it were necessary to extend it for a further six months, uh, then that would be done. But the perspective, therefore, is for January 2015 to be the time when uh, we hope the process of lifting the major financial and European and, and major financial and uh, uh, oil sanctions uh, will begin. So any commercial perspective for uh, Iranian relations with the West uh, has got uh, that time frame in front of it. All right. Well, clearly the um, uh... The, the, the nuclear issue and the, 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 the agreement uh, between Western uh, nations uh, and Iran on Iran's nuclear program is, is, is uh, very much connected with all of this. But I want to I turn the discussion back to this particular visit, if I can, and uh, turn back to uh, Babak Imamian, if I can. You mentioned earlier how you were surprised um, that there was nobody from the business community who, who was sent uh, in this delegation. Why do you think that is? The reason is because Iranian politics is, is, is in revolutionary mood. And uh, the Western economies, whether it's United States or Britain, would find it difficult to have negotiation with a country that is in revolutionary mode. What do you mean by because that, revolutionary mood? Well, they're not normal countries. They are constantly, they, they, they are in hostility, a stage of hostility with other countries, and they're not stable, uh, and they're not normal country. Let, let's put it this way, normalized country. They're not normal. Uh, that's what I'm trying to establish. Uh, they're either hostility, like the issue of a nuclear issue. Iran is the only country in the world which has this issue now. Um, and it, it can be resolved very easily, as Professor Ziba Kalam has said. It's not resolved. Uh, it's going to have a major impact on Iranian economy and uh, Iranian ordinary people. So, uh, the, the, uh, and going back to that, why is it difficult to negotiate with a country that is in revolutionary mood? It's because you be constantly negotiating about. Uh, resolving conflicts, while in Western economies they like to talk about trade and business. That's what most when when they have discussions about it is about. That's how you become productive. But dealing with a country like such as Iran, which is in revolutionary mood, you don't make any money. You don't have anything. That's why this delegation has gone there and said, "Can you please just ease off on your revolutionary mood, become a normal country, so we could have trade and business with you and join in the world community?" That's the message that they're trying to say, uh, and I hope the Iranian authorities will be listening to that. Uh, Sadiq uh, Zibakalem, um, uh, there's uh, a history of, of, of animosity between, uh, uh, when we talk about relations between Iran and, uh, and, and Britain. I mean, Iranian hard, hardliners who have often had a, a deep suspicion of, of British politicians in general and have mm. accused London uh, in the past of, of trying to meddle uh, in Iran's uh, internal affairs, uh, and it is known that they've been nervous about this particular uh, visit. How are they likely uh, to view this? 
Well, uh, let me uh, partly respond to your question and partly to Babak uh, Imamian's uh, um, description. The point is that, as you, as you quite correctly mentioned it, uh, the past history has been full of animosity and mistrust between uh, b b British, uh, British government and Iranian p people. It, it, not only with the, the Islamic um, uh, revolutionary Islamists, uh, b b but also under the Shah. The Shah relation with Britain was uh, very much uh, not trusting uh, b uh, British. And there's a saying in Iran that anything that goes wrong as, uh, as I'm sure Sir Richard would agree with me, that anything that goes wrong in Iran, they say, well, it's, 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 uh, the British uh, have a hand in it. It's because of that history and also, and also the fact that Britain has been regarded as a close ally of the United States, uh, not like Germany, not like uh, France, for example. Britain has been uh, the other side of the coin, if you like, of, uh, of United States. Because of that, every move towards, uh, towards uh, the Britain must be taken very cautiously, very slowly, you mustn't forget that uh, that uh, Jack Straw was uh, was supposed actually to come on the inauguration of uh, President Rouhani. But the hardliners disagree, and the hardliners are still unhappy about any rapprochement uh, with uh, between Tehran and London. So I think it was a wise move. I disagree with with Babak uh, Imamian. I think it was a wise move not to include. Uh, um, uh, uh, people, let us first examine the ground, let us warm up the, 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 the atmosphere, and then surely the, the, the economy and the trades and the businessmen uh, would follow the first visit. Well, let's get a, a former ambassador's view on this then. Richard Dalton, uh, how much does the historical an animosity between uh, uh, Iran and, and, and Britain play into all of this? Professor Sadiq is, is absolutely right. You have to get the political ground prepared before trying to send in large numbers of business people. The businessmen on both sides will take their own decisions when they consider that the risks of doing business with abate, have abated and when the legal proscription against doing very wide ranging business with Iran uh, has been lifted. So uh, there was never any question of this visit which is a parliamentary visit. It's not a commercial visit in any sense. Uh, there was never any question of it uh, being uh, diverted into any premature discussion of commercial affairs. Uh, the visit is being organized by the Majlis in Tehran. Uh, the delegation is entirely made up of British parliamentarians. Uh, so it's an opportunity for the representatives of the people of each country to discuss uh, their mutual concerns. Uh, the, the history of Britain's relations uh, with Iran have had these dramatic ups and downs, but most of the hostility, I'm afraid, has come from certain circles uh, in Tehran. Uh, Britain sought with its European partners in the 1990s uh, to re-establish a effective political dialogue that would deal with weapons of mass destruction with the Middle East peace process with the fight against uh, terrorism, uh, with human rights questions, which are very important. Uh, and we failed. Uh, the uh, European Union's dialogues with Iran came to an end uh, soon after the election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Now, it's too soon even to think in terms of restoring that common European framework for a relationship between the European Union uh, and Iran. I believe it should come and that it will come uh, if we can get the nuclear negotiations on a positive track. Uh, back in September, President Rouhani, discussing Iran's relations with the United States, said, first let's solve the nuclear question, then let's see if we can establish between Iran and the United States a framework for managing our relationships. And the European Union will want to do the same thing. And given the fact that the base from which the European Union starts is a much higher one, involving both comprehensive diplomatic relations and 
uh, a past close commercial relationship, uh, I would expect the European Union to be able to go much faster than the United States. Well, let's talk more then about uh, President Rouhani's approach to all of this. Uh, Sadiq Zibakalam, Zibaka all of this um, has come about since uh, Rouhani became uh, president uh, uh, in the summer of, uh, of last year, the nuclear agreement and now this visit uh, by the UK delegation. Um, but do you think that he, he has to uh, tread a, a fine line here uh, in terms of, of, of not wanting to anger uh, the, the hardliners that you mentioned earlier? Exactly. Uh, I, uh, I describe uh, 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 Mr. Rohani's position as an um, acrobatist uh, who is uh, walking on the rope and uh, he's holding that, that tight uh, balance. I mean, he must be very careful if he, uh, if he bends too much towards the left, he would antagonize the, the, the hardliners on, on, on the right. If he tilts towards them, um, he, he, he has this danger of losing uh, a lot of support, a lot of, of that uh, 19 million vote that, that, that he received about uh, five months ago. So he is really walking on a very tight rope and he must be very careful uh, to be exactly in the middle, not to, not to antagonize the hardliners and also um, not to lose hope and, and, and faith uh, of the people who supported him and voted for him, and he became president. Babak uh, Imanyan, how, how hopeful are you about all of the, how all of this will, will play out? I mean, are you confident that uh, at some point in time, uh, relations between uh, Britain and, and Iran will improve to the degree where they can start talking about economic uh, cooperation? I think, in my experience as a businessman, the biggest binding between anyone, biggest bond, is uh, business. You couldn't have anything stronger. Money is the biggest bonder between anything. So as long as you have good relationship, good trade and potential with Iran, then you could have a much better bonding. I mean, this is a British basic philosophy. Uh, so I'm surprised by what uh, uh, Sir Dalton is mentioning about this being going slow on the economic side. The other thing is Iran's economy is going to be 150 billion this year, maybe coming down with a capital per head of less than $2,000. There are 40 percent up to 50 percent going up unemployment in Iran with 50 percent inflation. The hardship on Iranians is so much that my heart goes out to them. There are people are dying because they cannot afford health care. Children are going hungry every, uh, every day. More children are going hungry. Yet here we are sitting comfortably in our studios talking about things going slowly and people sitting in the Iranian government, they are also fed well. They are feeling uh, well about it and nobody cares about ordinary Iranian people. We must open up Iranians' economy as soon as possible to help the Iranians unemployed, the Iranian poor people. I mean, that's what we are here for, not about delegating, okay, we do this and that, but helping Iranian economy. So Iran joins the world community and becomes a better nation for what it is. I want to give the last word then to uh, Richard Dalton. Uh, do you think this will eventually re lead to a resumption of full diplomatic relations between the two countries where embassies would be uh, fully reopened? Yes, I do, and that is because I, I'm an optimist uh, about the immediate problem, which is the nuclear question. Uh, there is a way of solving the nuclear conundrum and of ensuring both Iran's practical needs for nuclear technology and assuring full respect for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty <laughs> and no breakout to nuclear weapons. So because I'm optimistic that the problem can be solved, uh, I believe that uh, full diplomatic relations with ambassadors uh, in each other's capitals uh, will be restored and that we will be able to move ahead uh, in the way that uh, Babak Imamian uh, clearly wishes. All right. Well, it'll be very interesting uh, to see how all of this uh, does uh, play out uh, over the next uh, few months. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. Uh, to uh, my guests, Sadiq Zibakalam, Babak Imamian, and Richard Dalton. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. As always, if you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks for watching. Join us again 24 hours from now when my colleague Stephen Cole will be here. Bye for now.